Amen. How are you guys today? Good. It's great to see all of you here on this historic weekend, really, for Frontline. And uh, I know some of you are like me. You are feeling the urge, the urge to merge. I've waited for laughter every single one of those services, and like uh, every time, nobody laughs, but I keep saying it anyway, so I think it's awesome. Uh, anyway, it's great to have you with us, and um, I want to let you know about something that's actually not connected to the merger, but it affects it, uh, that we've been talking about at the leadership level at Frontline for the last year. Um, if you've been behind the lines, you may have heard of it already, or if you, certain uh, serving groups have probably heard this already. Um, but uh, our denomination, every seven years, allows for ordained pastors um, in ministry, uh, at the same church in ministry, to take a sabbatical every seven years. Um, and so our leadership team, it has been seven years for me since my last sabbatical, our leadership team has graciously um, uh, offered me a three-month sabbatical this summer where I'm going to be stepping back from the ministry of the church, stepping back from teaching and preaching, uh, for the purpose of reconnecting with God and letting Him put back into me and reconnecting with my family and just uh, taking some time um, to allow God's Spirit to speak to me. And so uh, the idea of this comes from Scripture. The idea of Sabbath is where it comes from. The Israelites in the Old Testament were asked uh, for six years to work and then the seventh year they would let the land lie fallow. And that was the sabbatical year. And so for those of us who teach and preach and give, uh, there are seasons where we need to step back and allow God to put back into us so we have more to teach and preach and say. And so um, if this is becoming more and more common in churches, it's also becoming more and more common in academic circles, anywhere where, where someone teaches and preaches. And so I'm going to be taking this time and reconnecting, and I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, my wife and I were talking um, as well uh, about how this uh, particular sab sabbatical, this will be the last time I get one of these while all four of my boys are still under one roof. And so for us, this is a, a, gonna be a really key summer for us to connect as a family and to plant seeds uh, for the future with our kids. And so um, a couple things you need to know about that as I'm stepping into that time, it's gonna um, happen after June 5th. June 5th will be my last Sunday and then um, going through the three months of the summer. Um, but a couple things, first of all, maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, oh no, what about this merger, right? We're about to take this merger and you're gonna step back from things. I just want you to know that has been a part of the conversation from the very, very beginning as we've begun to explore and talk about what this merger might be to have a second campus. Um, we've known for the last year that I'm going to be taking this sabbatical. We've been planning and talking about it. So uh, I really feel like this is a time, not only do we have a good plan in place uh, to take care of things as I step back, but also I really believe this is going to be a season where God is going to call on some of the staff and some of the leaders in our church to step forward. And it's going to call them to go to a new level of leadership as well. And I think that's going to be a really healthy thing for us as a church to move forward into the future. Um, so that's one thing. I just kind of wanted to uh, kind of set your mind at ease if you were worried about that. And the second thing, more importantly, when you walked in in your bulletin, there is this long, skinny uh, piece of paper. It just says um, Summer Speaker Series on it. And it literally is the speakers, the people who are going to be speaking throughout the summer. And uh, we just wanted to let you know who is coming. Um, obviously, Matthew DePrez, uh, our intergenerational pastor, who would be the, the pastor of the second campus, he's going to be preaching um, throughout the summer uh, three times, just like he normally would be. But then uh, I also, personally, I have spent a ton of my time personally setting up and preparing um, this speaker schedule. And I want to let you know, we really took uh, time and prayerfully thought through, and I personally really prayerfully thought through, who do we need to ask to come in? And this summer, the speakers who are going to come in and speak while I'm gone are going to be people who bring spiritual depth and insight into our congregation. Each one of them are people, I believe, who have something to say to our congregation for this season of time um, in the church's life that are going to help us move forward into the future. Okay, so we didn't just kind of go, well, who's around that we could just sort of get to come and fill in, you know, while Brian's gone. We didn't do that. Uh, we put some money into this. Um, to be very honest with you, like we paid travel time and we're bringing in people and we have never done anything like that as a church. We've never, like, paid to bring people in and do that kind of thing. It's just not been part of what we've done. So this is kind of a first for us. And the reason I tell you that is to say, don't check out this summer. Uh, there's going to be some things that are said and some speakers who come in, and I believe every single one of them is going to have something 
powerful to say that is going to help you and is going to help us as a church move forward. And it's a season where we need to hear from some other people. Uh, so lean in. And then the other thing is we're making, uh, we're calling it the Zero Podcast. Matthew and myself have been uh, doing a podcast that we'll release over the summer and you can download it. So if you're at the lake or if you're taking some vacation time, of course, you know, we expect you to do that and get some time as a family as well. You'll be able to uh, hear a little bit more about the vision of the church and the Zero uh, emphasis, and so that's going to be an exciting thing, trying a new podcast for the summer while that's happening. So uh, that's basically the message. Uh, we just want you to lean in and stay connected because God's going to say some things this summer and we don't want to miss it. Sound good? Okay, awesome. Uh, go ahead if you guys can run the video. So there's not necessarily a problem to solve that would get us out of exile. There's not necessarily a tension we need to manage in some way that we're not managing. A lot of times in exile, you have no control. There, there, you have no way to get a handle on anything that's happening. It's just a season where you have to endure. And so we've been looking at the biblical story of exile, where God's people uh, lose the city of Jerusalem, and it's sacked by the Babylonians, and the temple is destroyed, and they're carried off for 70 years into Babylon, into a time of exile. And so we've been looking at, starting in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, the writer Jeremiah speaks God's words to the people who are in exile. And so we've been looking through those chapters in the Bible and talking about where do we find hope? Where do we find hope in a time of exile in our lives? And so today I want to talk a little bit, to wrap this series up, on how do you get a new dream when you're in exile? My wife Carrie works... Uh, as a nurse, as an RN in the foster care system. She actually is the nurse for uh, a group home uh, that here in our community for kids who have been uh, removed from their family for a period of time. And uh, She came home a couple weeks ago from uh, her day and I asked, I said, how was your day? And she said, it was a really tough day today. And I said, well, why was that? And she said, it was a tough day today because of one child. Uh, there was a kid who literally just dismantle the entire home, the destruction of property, uh, screaming profanities. Apparently this kid had assaulted a couple of staff members and some other people. And so Carrie just said the whole day was spent trying to you know, figure out how to manage this one kid and the issues with it. And I said, well, why was that? This is a kid that apparently hadn't been a problem like this uh, up to this point. So why today? Why was that such a problem? And she said, well, the day before this, he had his goodbye meeting with his mom. Uh, if you're not familiar with the foster care system, the way it works is um, when the courts make a decision to terminate parental rights of a child, what happens is they're allowed one final uh, supervised visit between where the parents and the children, the child, gets to sit down uh, supervised together in a room, and uh, they get to say goodbye because that's going to be the last time they are allowed to have contact with each other for a period of time, um, in a lot of cases forever. And so, Carrie said, this weekend, right before Mother's Day, the, t the courts made the decision to terminate this kid's parental rights from his parents. And so the day after Mother's Day, he sits down with his mom in a room with, with somebody there supervising, and he says goodbye to his mom. The following day, he is dismantling everything and anyone who would dare to come to the 10 foot radius now. Why? Because there is a dream that has died. There is this dream of a reunification, a reunion that was supposed to happen. And now it's time to get a new dream. That dream is gone. 
it's time to step into a new dream for life. And that is hard for any of us. No matter what age we are, no matter what level of maturity are, we are, it is hard. It's some of the hardest stuff in life. We've talked about dreams before, and you know, whenever we talk about dreams for our lives, we've said this, dreams typically involve a clock and a compass. You think about how people describe the dreams they have for their lives. They always describe it in terms of there's a clock and there's a compass. So in other words, by this time in my life, it's a clock, I am going to be at this destination. That's, there's the compass. I mean, when you talk about your dreams, that's how you describe it. When, when I'm 22, I will graduate from college. Right? There's a clock and there's a compass. That's how we describe a dream. Unless you're like me, I, I managed to squeeze four years of college into four and a half years. Uh, so we all can't be as talented as me, I guess. But they, we involve a, it involves a clock and a compass whenever we describe our dreams. Uh, when I'm 62, I will retire. That's a dream. Uh, uh, by the time I'm 30, I will have a child. By the time I'm 40, I will have moved up in the company. Right? It's a dream. That's how we describe it. By the age of 39, I will have mastered dressing like an adult. <laughs> That's my dream. I'm working on that one. That's how we describe a clock and a compass. So when we think about exile, go ahead. Uh, the path out of exile, for many of us, involves our dreams. Um, so for many of us, this is what the path looks like. We, we begin with a dream for our lives. There's a clock and a compass. By this point, I'm going to be here. And then what happens is we go through a season of exile where our clock and our compass get completely dismantled. And we go, man, apparently God's plans were not my plans. And everything falls apart. And we realize we're not going to get where we thought we were going to be by the time we thought we were going to be there. And so for many people, what ends up happening is they end up spending the rest of their life trying to get back to the original dream. Right? They, they literally take the rest of their lives, and the rest of their life is all consumed with, how do I get back to that original dream that I had before exile? Right? I call this the 21 Pilots approach. If we could turn back time to the good old days, where our mama sang. Like 30% of you know that song. I thought that was going to be at least highly recognizable by a few of you. Right? You, hear this, you hear this language in our culture all the time. This is what people want to do. There's a verse in the book of Ezra. Um, Ezra is the book in the Bible that chronicles um, the first move back of, the people, of God's people back in the land of Israel to rebuild the temple. That's what they're doing. They're rebuilding the temple in the book of Ezra. There's this verse that talks about how the oldest of them, the ones who actually remember the original temple when they were children and when the exile happened, when they saw the foundations of the new temple, the rebuilt temple being laid, they wept out loud. And not in a good way. It says they wept out loud because they remembered the glory of the old temple. And when they saw the foundation of this new temple, it broke them because it was nothing like the old one. And this is how it is, isn't it? We very, very rarely can ever get back to an original dream. It's just not what happens usually. That's very rare that we go dream exile, then we're able to get back to an original dream for our lives. So because of that, a lot of times what other people do is they go dream exile, and they realize they can't get back to that original dream, and so what they do is they just kind of settle for a life in exile. And maybe you've done this. These are people who say things like, well, I guess this is just as good as my life gets. Uh, I guess my best days are probably behind me now. I guess this is just the way I am. You know, this, this is the language that gets used by people who have basically just settled in for a life in exile. <coughs> they, they had a dream, they went through exile, and now it's like, I'm never going to get back to what that was. And so they just settle for this sort of cynical, bitter life in exile. You, you've met those people. And I, I would argue today, the only way we really find hope when we're in a time of exile, really the only path out of exile, is to go through, have a dream, go through exile, and at some point to get a new dream. At some point we have to allow God to grant us a new dream. And if we don't get back to that place where we allow God to grant us a new dream, we have a hard time figuring out how to get out of exile. Hope comes from getting a new dream when we're in the midst of exile. If you're taking notes, 
I, I would just say it this way. In exile, we often have to let go of our old dream, and we have to get a new dream. We have to let go of what the old dream was for our life, and we have to allow God to grant a new dream. So again, Jeremiah 31, wrapping up this series, the last part of this, for the last, for a few chapters, Jeremiah speaks the words of God to this group of people who have lost everything. They're in exile, and we've been looking at those words God speaks to them, and this is kind of how, uh, as it winds down to the end, this is what God says to them. Verse 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. We've talked about that last week, about how that phrase appears again and again and again in the book of Jeremiah. But that's what God wanted. That I would be your God and that you would be my people. That's what he wants. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. So God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with my people. And it's not going to be like the old covenant, the first covenant that I made with them. Now the word covenant there uh, is a legal term. That's what it is. It was legal language, and it literally means an agreement. Or maybe closer to our language today, it would mean like a contract. That's what a covenant was. And so it had this, these terms to it. It had like, you do this, and I'll do this. We're agreeing that you're going to do your part, and I'm going to do my part. And so God says, there's a new covenant. There's a new deal I'm working on here. There's a new agreement. There's a, a, a new situation that's going to happen, and it's not going to be like the first one. Which raises a couple of big general questions right off the bat, doesn't it? Um, so maybe if we could just take a moment and answer. Some of you have never heard this. You've never wrestled with this at all. But a couple of big general questions this passage of Scripture raises. First of all, what was the Old Covenant? What's he talking about when he says, I, there's a new covenant. It's not going to be like the Old Covenant. What are we talking about when, we, when he talks about the Old Covenant? Uh, in Exodus 20, in the Bible, you can read about the first covenant that God made with his people. Uh, what happens is God takes, um, he, he rescues his people, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt, and he leads them out into the desert. And there in Exodus 20, God gives them the first covenant of the law. And Exodus 20 is where you find the Ten Commandments. And from the Ten Commandments, the Jewish people uh, served 613 total laws. And it was part of their covenant contract with God. It was the old deal. And basically the idea was, behind it was, uh, if you do these laws, if you follow these laws, then you will be my people and I will be your God. And that was, the, that was kind of the deal. That was the first covenant. Now there are three parts to the law. You can break down into three parts. There's the moral law, there's the ceremonial law, and there is the civil law. The moral law has to do with uh, the Ten Commandments. Things like uh, don't kill people. Like It's a good idea not to kill people. That's, that's the moral law. Then there's this whole part that's called the ceremonial law, and it had to do with the sacrificial system and how exactly to do the correct ceremonies and the length and the width and the dimensions of different elements and tools that were used. So there was that whole part of it, the ceremonial law. And then there was the civil law, which had to do with uh, crime and punishment. So the Israelites at that time, under that old covenant, they were, it was a theocracy which big fancy word basically means God governed. And so it was all, there was this whole part of the law was just about what do you do with people who break the law and, and, and who mistreat each other? It was crime and punishment is what it was. So under the new covenant, the only part of the, the law that we really still kind of hold as we should follow that today is the moral law, right? Because the moral law revealed who God was, what his character was, and it revealed how we needed to align ourselves with that. So that's why, that's the only part of the law today that we still hold to or we still follow is the part of the law that was the moral law. And so the first covenant that God made with his people, it was predicated completely on their obedience to him. In other words, you need to follow all three parts of the law. You need to follow it and follow it perfectly. And 
their relationship with God was predicated on that. So what God says in chapter 31 that we just read a few minutes ago, he says, we tried that, it didn't work. God says, even though I was a husband to you, even though I was faithful to you, he's saying, you broke those laws. You couldn't do it. We tried it, and it didn't work. You couldn't live up to your end of the deal. So, God says, I am reaching out, I am acting to start a new covenant. So which raises the question, right? Obviously, what is the new covenant? What are we talking about? We talk about the new covenant. What, what was Jeremiah referring to there? Did this, remember, this is being said to a group of people in exile who are going to sit there for 70 years. God's talking about this new covenant. If you go into the New Testament, you see over and over again in the New Testament this language of new covenant. New, old covenant, new covenant. You, you find that all the time in the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews 9, verse 15, the writer of Hebrews talks about it and says, For this reason... Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins that were committed under the first, or the old, some translations say, under the old covenant. So somehow Jesus is a mediator of this new covenant. Now a mediator is just means someone who goes between God and man. So it's saying that Jesus, by his sacrificial, willing death on the cross, paid a ransom price for the sins that we all had committed under the old covenant, under the old deal. And that this new covenant we have because God has given us his forgiveness through Jesus and through who he is, through who he is. Um, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, in Luke chapter 22, he gathers his disciples together for this meal, this sacred meal. Uh, we still celebrate it today. It's called communion, whenever we celebrate it. Listen again. You can find this language of new covenant, even in what Jesus is saying about himself. Verse 20, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That language again, this is where we get this idea that Jesus, by his death, by his blood poured out, we are just even singing about this morning, he paid the ransom price that was owed because of our debt to sin under the old covenant, under the old deal, and it's through him. That's why we have new life. That's why we have hope. So simply put, if I could just kind of simply define in the most simple language I could possibly come up with what the new covenant is. The new covenant that we live under today and that Jeremiah was talking about is the covenant where we, we believe and then we receive. We believe in who Jesus is and then we receive his forgiveness. We receive God's, God's grace and his forgiveness through Jesus. It's not believe in who Jesus is and then achieve. Follow the laws perfectly. That, that's the old covenant. Believe in Jesus. That's still the old deal. That's still the old covenant. It's I'm going to prove myself. I'm going to somehow by my own merit make myself worthy enough. And the new covenant in Jesus is believe in who Jesus is and receive the new dream, the new deal, the new covenant that God has for us in Jesus. That's the new covenant. That's what we're under. That's what we believe in. Um, now, I just want to say a couple words about that. Some of you are here today, and you are still working on the belief part. And we know this to be true. In every uh, one of every service that we have here at Frontline, there are a few of you who are here because you're curious. You're not sure you believe this stuff. Maybe somebody invited you, or you came um, with a friend, or, or maybe you're just going through a time in your life where you're just looking for some direction or guidance. And you've been coming, in, and maybe in your mind, you're saying to yourself, I don't know that I buy all this. Did Jesus really come to earth as God in human form? Did he really live a sinless, perfect life? Did he really offer himself willingly in a sacrificial death on the cross? Not just for the sin of the world, but for my sin personally as well? Did he really raise from the grave and that we have this hope of new life in him? Is that real? And I want you to know, if you're wrestling with that, if you're still trying to decide if you believe that or not, you are welcome here. In fact, Frontline Community Church exists for you. 
as why we started as a church, is we wanted to be a place where people could come and just experience and explore who Jesus was on, you know, in their own pace, at their own kind of direction and time. It's why we're talking about doing this merger with another church to try to reach more people for Christ in another part of our community that's growing very quickly. It's because that's why we exist as a church. Uh, so you are welcome here. We want you to continue to explore who Jesus is. And some of you are like, I just don't know if I believe in that. Others of you who are here, you have no problem with the word believe. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you've already just come to a place in your life where you believe in the claims that Jesus made about himself. You believe in who Jesus is. It's the word receive that you're having a hard time with. You're still, even though you believe in who Jesus is, you're still living in the old covenant. You're still living in the old dream, the old way. You're still trying to prove yourself. Follow a set of rules perfectly. Do everything just so. And the biggest challenge you have is, how do I let go of the old dream and embrace a new dream that God has for my life? You're still trying in your own human effort to achieve it or earn it, but it's believe and then it's the word receive. For many of us, we haven't quite figured that out yet. And I want you to know if that's you, you're welcome here too. And we're all at different points on, on a spiritual journey, trying to let God bring the new dream of who Jesus is into our existing life. That's what we're all here doing. So that, that's the big picture. There's been a couple of general questions. So I want to ask uh, a couple of personal questions. When, we, when you read Jeremiah chapter 31, you hear about Old Covenant, New Covenant. Hopefully that will help answer some of those big general questions. But now, for the next few minutes, I want to just get very, very personal. I want you to think about this in terms of you and your life personally. And here's the question. Does God want to bring a new dream for your life through Jesus? Maybe you're right now in a time of exile in your life. Maybe you're in a time where you've had a dream for your life and then it's fallen apart. And maybe you're in this place of either settling for life in exile or you're trying to figure out how to go back to the original dream. Does God want to bring a new dream for your life today through the person of Jesus Christ, through a relationship with Jesus? Does he want to do that? Is there somewhere where God wants to grant you a new dream for life? When I was 17 years old, I had been a Christian for two years, and the youth group where uh, I got saved and made the decision to follow Jesus, uh, there was a, a missions trip. And so uh, myself and a group of other students at 17 years old, we got into a 15-passenger van, and we drove out to the Black Hills of South Dakota to an Indian reservation, and we, we were there for a week on a missions trip where we partnered with a local church there to um, do some work in the community. And it was the first time in my life that I had ever seen real poverty. I mean, the, the kind of poverty that makes you sick to your stomach. Uh, I remember um, there was a, where that we stayed. There was this house um, that we stayed right in, right next to the church, and you could see the the streets. We were in this urban downtown area. And I remember it's about 11:30 at night. We were in that house, and I looked out the window of this house, and I remember seeing this little girl. And uh, she had been there the whole day. She was part of the, the ministry and the things we were doing, but I had never seen her parents. It's 1130 at night in this busy urban area, and she's walking around the streets, 1130. Nobody's coming for her. Nobody's even aware that she's there. And I remember that impacted me. That whole week, moments like that changed me. And I have this distinct memory. I remember getting to the end of that week, and, the, and we had done the work we were, had come to do. And I remember stepping onto the 15-passenger van. We had packed everything in. And I literally remember having this thought as I stepped onto the passenger van. I remember thinking, uh, I am leaving the version of myself that came out here on this van behind here in the Black Hills. I'm never going to see that person again. That... 17-year-old kid who came out here, that, that white suburban, relatively wealthy family kid who came out here that was unaware of how other people live, that kid is never coming back. I, I just had this sense like that time in my life is gone, 
and the person that's going to come back to Indiana and step off this van is going to be a totally different person. And it was time for a new dream for my life. That's what was happening. Uh, and I don't know how to explain this to you. I, I can't make sense of this for you. I don't know how to mathematically, like, <laughs> give you a, the formula for exactly how it happened. Here's you know, the exact dimensions of how it worked. All I know to be true is that from that moment, stepping back onto this, to that man, to this moment, standing right here on the stage in front of you, Jesus has been my guide. My relationship with Jesus has been my guide from that moment to this one. Everything I've done, everything I... I've done in ministry, everything I've done uh, to, be, to pursue God's call for my life and become a pastor, Jesus has been my guide for that. He's brought the new dream for my life yeah, every step of the way. More recently, um, in 2007, uh, my wife and I and our two oldest boys and our, our youngest son, uh, went to a doctor's office, and, I, and we walked into the doctor's office, and we sat down in the waiting room as a normal family, quote unquote. And that doctor's appointment was the first time that we, that a doctor looked at us and used the word autism to describe what was happening with our two-year-old son and what some of the behavior was. And I distinctly have this memory. I literally remember getting up to leave and thinking to myself, we are leaving those two parents with that normal family sitting here in this waiting room. We are never going to see them again. That, that family, that version of our family is gone. It's time to get a new dream for our family. And I don't know if I could put it in those kind of words exactly, but I remember having this thing, like, we are never going to go back to that. You've had these moments in life too, haven't you? You've had those moments where the phone call comes or the news hits you or an event happens in your life, and instinctively, in your gut, you know it, you feel it. It's like, this changes everything. I'm never, like, I'm not going to go back and be who I was just a few moments ago. And I don't want to explain this to you. <laughs> I literally, I can't quantify it for you. I can't mathematically, logically explain it to you exactly. But I know it to be true at the core, the very fiber of my being. From that moment to this moment, right now today, Jesus has been our guide as our family, for our family. Our relationship with Jesus, my wife and I, our relationship with Jesus together has been our guide navigating the whole new dream for our family that is coming. i got to tell you today, the dream that we have for our family now and the way our family works now is better than the dream we had back in 2007. I can't explain that to you. I can't, I can't quite quantify it for you. I just know it to be true. Jesus brings new dreams into the lives of people who are in exile, if we let him. I told you this whole series was predicated kind of for me, kind of came out of this past year of my life. It's been kind of a season of exile for me. And it began last April when I, I literally got a phone call from a nurse who told me that the results of my of a biopsy had come back and I had cancer. It was the same thing. It was, it was this moment on the phone. I literally heard, like this news hit you, and you think to yourself, I am never going to be the guy who answered this phone again, a few minutes ago again. But that guy is gone. The person who picked up that phone and answered it, I, I can say goodbye to him. I'm never going to see him again. You've had these moments, haven't you? And the news hits you, and you instinctively know it's time for a new dream for my future. It's time for a new dream for my life. And from that moment to this moment standing with you right now, Jesus has been my guide through this period of exile. My relationship with Jesus has been what has guided me every day from that moment to this one. And it's why I can stand here. You know, God led me through healing. Jesus has led me through uh, you know, perspective shifts and changes in the way I see myself, the way I see my future. And all, all I can say to you is that today I, I would look back on that phone call and say that was one of the best phone calls I ever got in my life. It's changed everything. And Jesus has been my guide. Jesus gives hope of a new dream to people who are in exile. Are you in exile today? Are you still trying to get back to the original dream? Are you, have you settled for 
life as it is in exile. I just wonder, for some of you today, does God want to bring a new dream for your life through the person of Jesus Christ? Okay, so, so here's the last question. Here's kind of how I want to wrap up this series and um, wrap up our time together. I just want to ask the question, will you let him? Will you let him do it? Um, for many of us, the problem is not with the word believe. You believe maybe you're at a place where you believe in who Jesus is. Maybe you even grew up in the church. Your problem is with the word receive. Your problem is with letting him do it. You're still clinging to that old dream for your life. So the question today is, will you let him do it? Will you let Jesus bring the new dream? There's a new dream, my friends. There's a new covenant. There's something new that God wants to bring into your life. But we have to receive it. We have to allow him to bring that new life uh, into, our, into where we live. So, so here's how I want to wrap up. Every uh, one of the sermons in this series, we close with a benediction. A benediction is just a blessing. It's, it's God's word spoken to his people, very much like Jeremiah 29 uh, through 31 is, is, um, is uh, shaped. And um, so we ended every sermon with, here's God's word. We've asked you to open your hands and receive uh, the words. And I'm not going to end with a blessing today. We're not going to end with a benediction. We're going to end instead with an invitation. Because that's how Jeremiah's uh, words to the people in exile end. <coughs> 